Hello everyone and welcome to another video on our own devices. I'm Jean Mestier and today I'm at 17 Wing in Winnipeg having a look at a pair of Gibson Girl survival radios. Now you recall that a little while back I already made a video on this particular device, but although I went over the basic design and history and accessories of the Gibson Girl, what I didn't do was open up the case to show you how it actually works. So that's what we're going to be doing today, taking a very deep dive into the electronics of the Gibson Girl. There's a lot of really interesting stuff going on inside here. So over its 30 year service life, the Gibson Girl went through a number of design changes with the World War II era version that we looked at in the previous video being the SCR578. This came in three sub variants designated A, B, and C. So all three transmitted at the then standard emergency frequency of 500 kilohertz. And in terms of controls, the Model A had a tuning knob, which allowed you to tune the antenna to the transmitter. And this allowed the transmitter to achieve peak performance, even if the entire 300 foot antenna could not be extended to its full extent. And when you turn the knob, this indicator lamp on the top would glow more or less brightly, indicating the degree of tuning. It would also flash along with the signal that was transmitted to indicate that the transmitter was properly driving the antenna. You also have a signal mode selector knob with six different positions. Now the first position is manual Morse code signaling using this key on the front. And the next two are automatic signaling modes where the Morse code message is automatically composed by a set of mechanical cams. And we'll have a look at that in just a second. The auto one setting transmits a string of SOS dot 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 dash 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 dot 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 for 20 seconds, followed by a continuous dash for 20 seconds. And the dash was to help rescue aircraft with radio direction finding. Auto two, on the other hand, transmitted a continuous string of A's dot dash for 20 seconds, followed by a continuous dash or tone for 20 seconds. And then the next three settings are for a head mounted signal lamp that would be plugged in to this socket here and was driven by the same dynamo as the transmitter. And so you could again key it manually using the key on the front or with one of the two automatic cam systems. And you could either operate the transmitter on its own or the signal lamp on its own, not both at the same time. Now the SCR578B variant was almost identical to the A variant but used a slightly different BC778B transmitter that had a different audio oscillator circuit to modulate the 500 kilohertz transmission. And finally the SCR578C eliminated automatic keying for the signal lamp. You could either key it by a hand or it remained continuously lit. Now, after the Second World War, the Gibson Girl underwent further modification and was redesignated the ANCRT3. Now, while the basic function was the same, the radio now transmitted at two different frequencies, 500 kilohertz as before and 8,280 kilohertz or 8,364 kilohertz for the B variant like this one, with the mechanism automatically swapping between the two every 40 to 50 seconds, depending on how fast you turn the crank. And there were two basic reasons for this. First, if you had a bunch of aircraft go down in the same area and there were a bunch of crews and life rafts simultaneously transmitting, odds were that any two radios would only be transmitting at the same frequency about half the time. And this reduced the confusion for rescue crews trying to gain a radio direction finding fix. Secondly, lower frequency transmissions like at 500 kilohertz tend to propagate as ground waves and thus have a limited range. Typically 500 kilometers in ideal conditions, such as out in the open ocean, and as short as 16 kilometers over wet ground. Higher frequency or shortwave transmissions, on the other hand, tend to propagate as sky waves bouncing off the ionosphere, and thus can achieve much longer ranges on the order of thousands of kilometers. And so transmitting at both frequencies allowed the ANCRT3 to achieve maximum coverage in the same compact package. Now the ANCRT3 also eliminated the tuning knob, 
And this was made possible by issuing the strict requirement that the entire 300-foot antenna be deployed at all times. And indeed, so important was this requirement that two extra spools of wire were issued with the ANCRT3 in case the original was lost or damaged. And this lamp no longer indicates the degree of tuning, but rather flashes along with the transmission to indicate that the transmitter is properly driving the antenna. Also, the mode selection knob now only has three positions. Manual radio signaling, a single automatic signaling mode, which sends a string of SOSs for 20 seconds, followed by a continuous tone for 20 seconds, with the mechanism swapping between 500 kHz and 8,280 kHz every 40 seconds. And as we'll see a little bit later, these two signals were modulated in different ways. The 500 kHz signal via amplitude modulation, or AM, and the 8,280 kHz signal via interrupted continuous wave modulation. And then finally, the last position is manual signaling using the signal lamp. Right, so let's actually take these apart to show you how they work, starting with the wartime SCR578. So this is designed for use out at sea, so the faceplate has a very heavy gasket on it and is held on by no fewer than 16 screws. So if we remove these, the faceplate comes off. You can see that this is divided into two modules. The transmitter itself which is attached to the inside of the faceplate and the power supply and automatic camming unit, which is attached to the inside of the case. Now, if we take the crank off, we'll see that there are four screws and a threaded collar holding this on. And if we remove those, then we can remove the power source unit completely. And here we have the full circuitry for the Gibson girl. All right, so let's start by looking at the power source. Now this is driven by a hand crank that is normally stored in a recess in the back of the case and slots and threads in just like that. And of course, as I covered in the previous video, the unique shape of the Gibson girl is so that you can actually hold it between your knees while turning the power crank. And there's also a strap that you wrap around your knees to further secure the radio. So this hand crank is attached to a gearbox with two outputs, a step up unit to drive the dynamo to power the transmitter and a step-down unit to power these plastic cams, which are for the automatic keying system. You can see the different Morse messages carved into the rims of the cams. And you can see that these work by intermittently opening and closing these little spring contacts. And these are constantly operating, which means that when you actually turn the selector knob, all you're doing is connecting or disconnecting various circuits to these cams. Now, if you were to turn this handle too quickly, these signals could become incomprehensible. And so the gearbox includes a split ring friction governor similar to the ones we looked at in my video on rotary phones. So how this works is that if the mechanism spins too quickly, then the ring will expand and push against the rim of the collar, creating friction that slows down the rate of rotation and thus keeps the entire mechanism spinning at a reasonable rate. Now on this side, we have the DC generator or dynamo that powers the transmitter and the signal lamp. And this has two windings on its armature, a primary winding that supplies 28 volts to power the filaments of the vacuum tubes, the relays, the two ballast lamps, and the signal lamp, and a secondary winding connected in series with the primary that supplies 300 volts to the vacuum tube plates and grids. Now, as you can imagine, it is possible to both undercrank the dynamo, producing insufficient voltage to run the transmitter, and also to overcrank it, potentially overloading and damaging the circuit. And for this reason, the Gibson Girl includes a very clever power regulation system. So how this works is that as you start turning the handle, the low voltage side of the generator will produce voltage due to the residual magnetism in the field coil assembly in the rotor. The resulting current flows through the normally closed contacts of relay K101 and into the field coil on the rotor, reinforcing the field and boosting the generator output voltage. Meanwhile, some of this current also flows through the K201 relay coil, the current being limited by resistor R201. When the generator reaches a certain speed, the current becomes sufficient to operate relay K201, opening the normally closed contact. This does two things. First, it redirects the current into the ballast lamps located underneath the speed indicator window here. And second, it shorts out the generator field coil, weakening the magnetic field and reducing the generator output. As the current drops, the relay contacts close, re-energizing the field coil and increasing the output voltage anew, and so on and so forth. And this produces a negative feedback loop that maintains the output voltage of the dynamo at nominal levels no matter how fast you turn the crank. 
And if the system is operating correctly, then this relay will be buzzing due to the constant switching, and the ballast lamps underneath the indicator window will remain lit, indicating that you're cranking at the correct speed. Now, the last major feature to point out on this module before moving on is this capacitor, C107, which acts as a high voltage filter for the dynamo output. Right, so let's move over to the transmitter itself. And a couple of peripheral features to point out here. This is a desiccant well, which holds a packet of silica gel to keep the electronics dry. This well right here holds 300 feet of wire antenna, and this can be held aloft either with a box kite or a hydrogen balloon. And to learn more about those accessories, please check out my previous video on the Gibson Girl, link in the description. And then finally, on this side, this well is for the ground, which is attached to this lead weight, which can be dropped into the water to ground the radio against the salt water. Right, so finally we come to the transmitter circuit itself, which consists of four basic modules. The audio oscillator, the amplifier, the RF oscillator, and the antenna assembly. So the audio oscillator generates a 1 kHz tone, which is amplified and along with the signal key or the automatic signaling cams is used to modulate the 500 kHz signal generated by the RF oscillator. This modulated signal is then sent to the antenna to be transmitted. While the SCR578A used a resistance capacitor audio oscillator, all subsequent models used a shunt-fed Hartley oscillator circuit. This consists of the left-hand side of vacuum tube or valve V101, which is a 12SC7 double diode, audio transformer T101, and capacitor C101 and C102, with the whole circuit being tuned to resonate at a frequency of 1 kHz. The B-plus plate bias voltage is supplied by R1022, which is the plate load resistor. Any signal at the plate of the oscillator is fed back by C1022 to T101 and only signals at the resonant frequency get past the grid by transformer action. That signal is amplified and fed back again, forming a positive feedback loop causing continuous oscillation. That oscillation is then fed to the grid of the right-hand amplifier section of the tube. There it appears amplified on the plate of the amplifier and is fed to the RF oscillator. Note that the cathodes on both sides of the tube are connected, forming a common cathode resistor which biases both valves by means of the voltage drop across it. And finally, capacitor C103 introduces negative feedback to the overall oscillator amplifier stage, helping to ensure that the oscillation is a pure and stable note. The RF oscillator, meanwhile, is based around valve V102, which is a beam power tetro, though the intricacies of vacuum tube design are a little bit beyond the scope of this video. V102 is connected to L101, L102, C105, C106.1, and C106.2 to form a Colpitts oscillator, which serves as both an oscillator and power amplifier tuned to generate a 500 kHz RF signal. The 1 kHz signal from the audio oscillator is fed into the RF oscillator to modulate the 500 kHz carrier wave, with the on-off keying of the RF signal being accomplished by intermittently returning the cathode to ground, and thus turning off the RF oscillator using the manual signal key or automatic signaling cams. Tuning of the antenna to the transmitter is accomplished via variable capacitor C107, which is connected to the manual tuning knob. At the same time, Indicator lamp L101, which is inductively coupled to the RF tank circuit, will light up, its brightness indicating the degree of tuning. Right, so let's move on to the post-war ANCRT3 radio, which comes apart just like the SCR578. So as I mentioned at the beginning of the video, there are a number of major differences between the older SCR578 radios and the later ANCRT3 including the gear train on the power source. So instead of two outputs, we now have three. One to run the dynamo as before, and two running at 0.6 and 1.2 RPM respectively to run the automatic switching and signal cams. So whereas the SCR578 had two automatic signaling modes, this has only one, which transmits SOFs for 20 seconds, followed by a continuous tone for 20 seconds, while the second cam, which rotates at half the speed of the first, switches the transmitter between 500 kHz and 8,364 kHz every 40 to 50 seconds. Otherwise, however, the power source is effectively identical to the SCR578. Now, Moving over to the transmitter, the 500 kilohertz oscillator circuit is essentially identical to the SCR578. But of course, we also have a second oscillator circuit for transmitting at 8,364 kilohertz. 
This circuit, however, is not driven by a Colpitts oscillator, but rather a piezoelectric crystal oscillator, Y101. It also has no audio oscillator circuit, since the higher frequency signal is not amplitude modulated, but rather transmitted by interrupted tenuous wave modulation. That is, the carrier wave is intermittently switched on and off by the manual signal key or automatic keying cams. When the frequency switching cam switches transmission to the higher frequency, relay K101A disconnects the 500 kHz tuning circuit from the antenna and connects crystal oscillator Y101, while relay K101B disconnects the B plus supply from V101, disabling the audio oscillator, and switches V102's tank circuits to alternate components more suited to the higher frequency. Indicator lamp 101 is now driven by coil L105C, which is inductively coupled to the higher frequency tank circuit. And when the transmitter is operating at 500 kilohertz, the lamp is instead driven by coil L104B. Now, as I mentioned at the beginning, there are two main reasons for switching between two transmitting frequencies. The first being to help with radio direction finding, and the second to achieve maximum range. And in this case, that range is achieved via both the skywave propagation properties of shortwave transmissions, but also the much narrower bandwidth achievable by interrupted continuous wave transmission. But to explain how that works would require going into the theory of heterodyne receivers and a bunch of other things, and this video is getting long enough as it is, so I will save that for a future video. Anyway, that's all I have for you today. Thank you so much for watching, and a huge shout out to Julian Horn, my assistant, for helping me work out all of the complex technical details inside these radios. I'll see you next time in another video where we'll look at yet more radios and other fascinating devices just like these. Until then, I'm Jean Messier from Our Own Devices. Have a great day.